Rod Serling passed away on June 28, 1975, at the age of 50. But his legacy and greatest work lived on. Many Hollywood big shots in the 1970s and 80s grew up watching The Twilight Zone, so it makes sense that during this period, the series started to get revisited and would continue to evolve as the decades wore on. We're going to go through the various forms The Twilight Zone took. Just what did this franchise spawn without its creator? And can any of it compare to the original? From 1981 to 1989, The Twilight Zone magazine filled the void for fans of the series with short stories from prominent writers, movie reviews slash previews, and just generally kept the spirit of the show alive in a monthly written form. In 1982, the first edition of Mark Scott Zickrey's The Twilight Zone Companion hit the market and became a go-to source for zoners who were looking to relive every episode of the original series. Zikri's book was my main source of behind-the-scenes information for every video I've made on The Twilight Zone, including the one you're watching now. If you're into the show as much as I am, it's an absolute must-read with an abundant amount of TZ knowledge to fill your head with. Gold Key Comics also never stopped producing comic books from the time the show was originally airing through the mid-1980s. In addition, several short story collections were released in book form, mostly from the 1960s, including this one right here. The point is, The Twilight Zone never really died. It lived on in reruns and by these supplementary means until a new idea brought the series to the big screen. You just crossed over into The Twilight Zone. The Steven Spielberg-produced Twilight Zone the movie from 1983 was the first successful attempt to adapt the series into a theatrical film, but it wasn't the only time this idea came up. Rod tried to put forth plans for a movie on several occasions in various formats. In 1963, he tried to recruit Kirk Douglas to star in an anthology TZ film inspired by the 1945 British horror picture Dead of Night. Elements from Dead of Night also inspired Serling to write the season 3 episode The Dummy, so that piece of work seemed to impact him immensely during this period. He later wrote a feature-length version of It's a Good Life and attempted to expand the season 4 installment He's Alive into a theatrical cut, but these projects never got off the ground. Apparently, there were other pitches to resurrect the franchise while Rod was still around, yet he was always shot down. His friend and original producer of The Zone, Buck Houghton, said that Serling was constantly told any kind of revival or adaptation wouldn't be popular. Quite a shame. The movie that made it to the silver screen took the anthology approach with a mix of new talent and established Zone veterans returning. Along with Spielberg, John Landis, George Miller, and Joe Dante directed the individual segments. Richard Matheson returned as a writer with George Clayton Johnson also receiving a credit after the studio turned down his idea for the Kick the Can remake. It's a Good Life and Nightmare at 20,000 Feet were remade as well. Original content was featured in the first segment starring Vic Morrow and the short book ends featuring Dan Aykroyd. Returning with the writers were composer Jerry Goldsmith, actor Burgess Meredith as the narrator, Murray Matheson from Five Characters in Search of an Exit, Kevin McCarthy from Long Live Walter Jameson, Bill Moomy from the original It's a Good Life and other episodes, a short appearance from Rod's wife Carol, and even a cameo from Buck Houghton, among others. Houghton showed up in Joe Dante's version of It's a Good Life and would be disappointed with the direction the movie took. These guys don't get it, he was quoted as saying. While the movie has somewhat of a cult following now, it was only a moderate hit at the box office, with critic and audience reactions at the time being lukewarm at best. Making matters much worse was the well-publicized tragedy on set that took the lives of Vic Morrow and a pair of child actors. It was beyond a messy affair, with massive production errors leading to disaster. That whole horrible situation has been broken down at length across different forms of media, and it's impossible to not mention it when discussing the movie. Don't miss the Twilight Zone Silver Anniversary Special. A year after the film debuted, the Twilight Zone Silver Anniversary Special aired on television, re-releasing a trio of episodes from the original series that were previously taken out of syndication. Season 5's Sounds and Silences and A Short Drink from a Certain Fountain, and the Robert Duvall Season 4 effort, Miniature. The latter was even partially colorized for the special. The anniversary was hosted by star of A Short Drink, Patrick O'Neill. 
Following the movie and a failed attempt by Francis Ford Coppola, of all people, to resurrect the show earlier in the 80s, CBS finally decided to officially go forward with a full-on revival. The second Twilight Zone series premiered on September 27, 1985. Big names were initially brought in to write and direct with Wes Craven, Harlan Ellison, George R.R. R. Martin, Ray Bradbury, Martin Pascoe, Michael Reeves, William Friedkin, Joe Dante, and John Milius among them. Charles Aidman, who starred in two zones from the first series, was brought back to narrate off-screen, and they were off to the races with a very different show. Series supervisor Carla Singer and producers Phil Daguerre and James Crocker purposely provided a different vibe from Serling's version. It was in color, had a harder 80s edge, and a theme song from The Grateful Dead. Initially an hour long, two or three segments made up each episode. When it first hit TV screens, the new Twilight Zone was a ratings draw, but that quickly changed. It ended up barely getting greenlit for a second season. The hour-long episodes were slashed in half, and the show's subpar sophomore viewership had CBS thinking cancellation. However, the series was just short of the number of episodes needed to be properly syndicated, so they launched an altered version of the show produced by MGM UA. Its sole purpose was to release an additional 30 episodes to complete the syndication package. Among the many changes, Robin Ward replaced Charles Aidman as the narrator, and CBS even had him overdub the first two seasons for the sake of uniformity. The finale was first aired on April 15, 1989, which ended The Zone's second series at 65 installments across three seasons. Rod Serling's Lost Classics from the Twilight Zone. 1994 was an important year for the franchise. In May, a TV special aired called Twilight Zone, Rod Serling's Lost Classics, that featured a pair of newly filmed segments based on some of Rod's unproduced work. Richard Matheson was brought in to write a teleplay based on a newly discovered Serling outline. The other piece was a complete script that Serling wrote himself in 1968. This was all hosted and narrated by the late, great James Earl Jones. Honestly, it's worth watching just to hear him say, Your next stop, The Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone Tower of Terror, new at the Disney MGM Studios. A mere two months later, the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror attraction opened at Walt Disney World's Disney MGM Studios, where it still stands to this day. Rod was digitally resurrected to introduce the story of the ride with a voiceover by actor Mark Silverman. There are a ton of teasy Easter eggs hidden within the attraction, so if you want to hear more, check out my video on it. You're traveling to another dimension. You're entering the Twilight Zone. Jumping to 2002, a third Twilight Zone series was released on the UPN network. John Watson, Ira Stephen Bear, and Penn Denson produced, with Forrest Whitaker acting as the on-screen and off-screen narrator. The show featured a couple remakes of original TZ episodes and a sequel to It's a Good Life, with Bill Moomy and Cloris Leachman returning as the now-adult Anthony Fremont and his mother, respectively. The show's intro looked a little closer to some from the Serling era, but the more memorable of its two themes was a rock-type instrumental by the lead singer of Korn, Jonathan Davis. Lasting only 43 episodes and a single season, the third Twilight Zone series has its fans, yet failed to make as much of an impact as even the 1980s series during its broadcast run. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. The same year UPN's Zone began, the Twilight Zone radio show started. It ran for 10 years with 176 installments, most of them modern adaptations of classic episodes. There were even a few that adapted unproduced material from the first series. Some original stories were produced as well. Stacy Keach provided the narrator voice and several big stars made their way through across its run. Actors from the first series also popped up from time to time. While it may not be the most popular project in the franchise, I always hear about how much people enjoyed these audio dramas. I've listened to a handful myself, and they're definitely worth seeking out. 
If you think bad thoughts, I'll make you go in the cornfield. Thank you, guy in the cornfield. Yeah, what a brat. Many movies and TV shows referenced or were inspired by The Twilight Zone over the years. Some notable examples were a handful of The Simpsons' Treehouse of Horror episodes, Futurama's The Scary Door, a couple installments of Johnny Bravo, the Felicity episode Help for the Lovelorn, a Season 7 Gilmore Girls effort named after The Long Morrow, and a medium show from 2005 called Still Life, where Rod was once again digitally resurrected to instruct viewers when to put on 3D glasses. CBS Studios announced they're reviving The Twilight Zone, with Superman Returns and X-Men director Brian Singer attached to executive produce. According to The Twilight Zone companion, there were several failed attempts to revive the brand for new content in the early 2010s. Apparently, Brian Singer was supposed to bring back the show somewhere close to 2012. Around the same time, a new movie was announced, with Joseph Kaczynski, who helmed Tron Legacy and Top Gun Maverick, attached as director, with Leonardo DiCaprio on board as a producer. Those plans look to have fallen by the wayside. So why not come and join us in the Twilight Zone? For decades now, live stage productions have adapted episodes or were inspired by the series overall, providing even more ways to experience those stories. Comic books and other written media have also continued on, with Rod's family involved with a few books of their own. His widow, Carol, edited a few for the show's 50th anniversary in 2009, and one of Serling's daughters, Anne, wrote a memoir titled As I Knew Him, My Dad, Rod Serling. You're traveling through another dimension. You just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. The latest and loudest way the franchise has made a splash was with Jordan Peele's 2019 reboot for the then CBS All Access streaming service. Peele developed the fourth TZ show with Simon Kinberg and Marco Ramirez. He also appeared in the Rod Serling role of on-camera narrator. 20 episodes were produced over a couple seasons and it was announced in February of 2021 that the reboot wouldn't be returning for more. The reaction to the series seemed to be very mixed, with some critics and fans praising it, and others not quite as sold on the finished product. Serling was once again digitally resurrected, with Mark Silverman providing his voice for the season one finale, Blurry Man. What the future holds is anyone's guess. Another movie? TV or streaming specials? Something more out of the box? What would you like to see from The Twilight Zone next? Let me know in the comments, and I'll catch you somewhere in the zone.